A short excerpt from Kafka's The Trial, Chapter 9, in the Cathedral. Narrated by Joseph Vobel. An Italian colleague who was on his first visit to the town and was one of the bank's most influential clients was to be taken in charge by Kay and shown some of the town's art treasures and monuments. It was a commission that Kay would once have felt to be an honor. But at the present juncture, now that all his energies were needed, even to retain his prestige in the bank, he accepted it reluctantly. Every hour that he spent away from the bank was a trial to him. True, he was by no means able to make the best use of his office hours as once he had done. He wasted much time in the merest pretense of doing real work, but that only made him worry the more when he was not at his desk. In his mind, he saw the assistant manager who had always spied upon him prowling every now and then into his office, sitting down at his desk, running through his papers, receiving clients who had become almost old friends of Kay's in the course of many years, and luring them away from him, perhaps even discovering mistakes that he had made. For Kay now saw himself continually threatened by mistakes intruding into his work from all sides, which he was no longer able to circumvent. Consequently, if he were charged with a mission, however honorable, which involved his leaving the office on business, or even taking a short journey, and missions of that kind by some chance had recently come his way fairly often, then he could not help suspecting that there was a plot to get him out of the way while his work was investigated, or at least that he was considered far from indispensable in the office. Most of these missions he could easily have refused, yet he did not dare do so, since if there were even the smallest ground for his suspicions, a refusal to go would only have been taken as an admission of fear. For that reason, he accepted every one of them with apparent equanimity, and on one occasion, when he was expected to take an exhausting two days' journey, he even said nothing about a severe chill he had to avoid the risk of having the prevailing wet autumnal weather advanced as an excuse for his not going. When he came back from his journey with a racking headache, he discovered that he had been selected to act as escort next day for the Italian visitor. The temptation to refuse for this once was very great, especially since the charge laid upon him was not strictly a matter of business. Still, it was a social duty toward a colleague and doubtless important enough, only it was of no importance to himself, knowing as he did that nothing could save him except work well done, in default of which it would not be of the slightest use to him, in the unlikely event that the Italian were to find him the most enchanting companion. He shrank from being exiled from his work even for a single day, since he had too great a fear of not being allowed to return, a fear which he well knew to be exaggerated, but which oppressed him all the same. The difficulty on this occasion was to find a plausible excuse. His knowledge of Italian was certainly not very great, but it was at least adequate, and there was a decisive argument in the fact that he had some knowledge of art, acquired in earlier days, which was absurdly overestimated in the bank owing to his having been for some time, purely as a matter of business, a member of the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Monuments. Rumor had it that the Italian was also a connoisseur, and if so, the choice of Kay to be his escort seemed the natural one. It was a very wet and windy morning when Kay arrived at his office at the early hour of seven o'clock, full of irritation at the program before him, but determined to accomplish at least some work before being distracted from it by the visitor. He was very tired, for he had spent half the night studying an Italian grammar as some slight preparation. He was more tempted by the window, where he had recently been in the habit of spending too much time, than by his desk. But he resisted the temptation and sat down to work. Unfortunately, at that very moment, the attendant appeared, reporting that he had been sent by the manager to see if the chief clerk was in his office yet, and if he was, to beg him to be so good as to come to the reception room. The gentleman from Italy had already arrived. All right, said Kay, stuffed a small dictionary into his pocket, tucked under his arm an album for sightseers, which he had procured in readiness for the stranger, and went through the assistant manager's office into the manager's room. He was glad that he had turned up early enough to be on the spot immediately when required. Probably no one had really expected him to do so. The assistant manager's office, of course, was as empty as in the dead of night, 
very likely the attendant had been told to summon him too, and without result. When Kay entered the reception room, the two gentlemen rose from their deep armchairs. The manager smiled kindly on Kay. He was obviously delighted to see him. He performed the introduction at once. The Italian shook Kay heartily by the hand and said laughingly that someone was an early riser. Kay did not quite catch whom he meant, for it was an unfamiliar phrase, the sense of which did not dawn on him at once. He answered with a few fluent sentences which the Italian received with another laugh, meanwhile nervously stroking his bushy iron-gray mustache. This mustache was obviously perfumed. One was almost tempted to go close up and have a sniff at it. When they all sat down again and a preliminary conversation began, Kay was greatly disconcerted to find that he only partially understood what the Italian was saying. He could understand him almost completely when he spoke slowly and quietly, but that happened very seldom. The words mostly came pouring out in a flood, and he made lively gestures with his head as if enjoying the rush of talk. Besides, when this happened, he invariably relapsed into a dialect which Kay did not recognize as Italian, but which the manager could both speak and understand as indeed Kay might have expected, considering that this Italian came from the very south of Italy, where the manager had spent several years. At any rate, it became clear to Kay that there was little chance of communication with the Italian, for the man's French was difficult to follow, and it was no use watching his lips for clues, since their movements were covered by the bushy moustache. Kay began to foresee vexations, and for the moment gave up trying to follow the talk. While the manager was present to understand all that was said, it was an unnecessary effort to make. Confining himself to more observation of the Italian, lounging so comfortably and yet lightly in his armchair, tugging every now and then at the sharply peaked corners of his short little jacket, and once raising his arms with loosely fluttering hands to explain something, which Kay found it impossible to understand, although he was leaning forward to watch every gesture. In the end, as Kay sat there, taking no part in the conversation, only mechanically following his eyes, the seesaw of the dialogue, his earlier wariness made itself felt again, and to his horror, although fortunately just in time, he caught himself absent-mindedly rising to turn round and walk away. At long last, the Italian looked at his watch and sprang to his feet. After taking leave of the manager, he pressed up to Kay so close that Kay had to push his chair back in order to have any freedom of movement. The manager, doubtless seeing in Kay's eye that he was in desperate straits with this unintelligible Italian, intervened so cleverly and delicately that it appeared as if he were merely contributing little scraps of advice, while in reality he was briefly conveying to Kay the sense of all the remarks with which the Italian kept on interrupting him. In this way, Kay learned that the Italian had some immediate business to attend to, that unfortunately he was pressed for time, that he had no intention of rushing round to see all the sights in a hurry, that he would much rather, of course only if Kay agreed, the decision lay with Kay alone, confine himself to inspecting the cathedral, but to inspect that thoroughly. He was extremely delighted to have the chance of doing so in the company of such a learned and amiable gentleman. This was how he referred to Kay, who was trying hard to turn a deaf ear to his words and grasp as quickly as possible what the manager was saying, and he begged him, if it were convenient, to meet him there in a couple of hours, say at about ten o'clock. He had hopes of being able to arrive there for certain about that time. Kay made a suitable rejoinder. The Italian pressed the manager's hand, then Kay's hand, then the manager's hand again, and followed by both of them, turning only half toward them by this time, but still maintaining a flow of words, departed toward the door. Kay stayed a moment or two with the manager, who was looking particularly unwell that day. He felt that he owed Kay an apology and said they were standing intimately together, that he had at first intended to escort the Italian himself, but on second thoughts he gave no definite reason. He had decided that Kay had better go. If Kay found that he could not understand the man to begin with, he mustn't let that upset him, for he wouldn't take long to catch the sense of what was said, and even if he didn't understand very much, it hardly mattered, since the Italian cared little whether he was understood or not. Besides, Kay's knowledge of Italian was surprisingly good, and he would certainly acquit himself well. With that, Kay was dismissed to his room. The time still at his disposal he devoted to copying from the dictionary various unfamiliar words which he would need in his tour of the cathedral. It was an unusually exasperating task. Attendants came in with letters. Clerks arrived with inquiries, standing in the doorway when they saw that Kay was busy, yet not removing themselves until he answered. 
the assistant manager did not miss the chance of making a nuisance of himself and appeared several times taking the dictionary out of Kay's hand and with obvious indifference turning the pages over. Even clients were dimly visible in the antechamber whenever the door opened, making deprecating bows to call attention to themselves, but uncertain whether they had been remarked or not. All this activity rotated around Kay as if he were the center of it, while he himself was occupied in collecting the words he might need, looking them up in the dictionary, copying them out, practicing their pronunciation, and finally trying to learn them by heart. His once excellent memory seemed to have deserted him, and every now and then he grew so furious with the Italian who was causing him all this trouble that he stuffed the dictionary beneath a pile of papers with the firm intention of preparing himself no further. Yet he could not help seeing that it would not do to march the Italian round the art treasures of the cathedral in dumb silence, and so with even greater rage he took the dictionary out again. Just at half past nine, as he was rising to go, the telephone rang. Lini bade him good morning and asked him how he was. Kay thanked her hastily and said he had no time to talk to her, since he must go to the cathedral. To the cathedral? asked Lini. Yes, to the cathedral. But why the cathedral? asked Lini. Kay tried to explain briefly to her, but hardly had he begun when Lini suddenly said, They're goading you. Pity which he had not asked for and did not expect was more than Kay could bear. He said two words of farewell, but even as he hung up the receiver, he murmured half to himself and half to the faraway girl who could no longer hear him, Yes, they're goading me. By now it was growing late. He was already in danger of not being in time for the appointment. He drove off in a taxi cab. At the last moment he remembered the album which he had found no opportunity of handing over earlier and so took it with him now. He laid it on his knees and drummed on it impatiently with his fingers during the whole of the journey. The rain had slackened, but it was a raw, wet, murky day. One would not be able to see much in the cathedral. And there was no doubt that standing about on the cold stone flags would make Kay's chill considerably worse. The cathedral square was quite deserted, and Kay recollected how even as a child he'd been struck by the fact that in the houses of this narrow square nearly all the window blinds were invariably drawn down. A day like this, of course, it was more understandable. The cathedral seemed deserted, too. There was naturally no reason why anyone should visit it at such a time. Kay went through both of the side aisles and saw no one but an old woman muffled in a shawl who was kneeling before a Madonna with adoring eyes. Then in the distance he caught sight of a limping verger vanishing through a door in the wall. Kay had been punctual. Ten o'clock was striking just as he entered, but the Italian had not yet arrived. He went back to the main entrance, stood there undecidedly for a while, and then made the circuit of the building in the rain to make sure that the Italian was perhaps not waiting at some side door. He was nowhere to be seen. Could the manager have made some mistake about the hour? How could anyone be quite sure of understanding such a man? Whatever the circumstances, Kay would at any rate have to wait half an hour for him. Since he was tired, he felt like sitting down, went into the cathedral again, found on a step a remnant of carpet-like stuff, twitched it with his toe toward a nearby bench, wrapped himself more closely in his greatcoat, turned up his collar and sat down. By way of filling in time, he opened the album and ran idly through it. But he soon had to stop, for it was growing so dark that when he looked up, he could distinguish scarcely a single detail in the neighboring aisle. Away in the distance, a large triangle of candle flames glittered on the high altar. Kay could not have told with any certainty whether he had noticed them before or not. Perhaps they had been newly kindled. Vergers are by profession stealthy-footed. One never notices them. Kay happened to turn round and saw not far behind him the gleam of another candle, a tall, thick candle fixed to a pillar. It was lovely to look at, but quite inadequate for illuminating the altarpieces, which mostly hung in the darkness of the side chapels. It actually increased the darkness. The Italian was as sensible as he was discourteous in not coming, for he would have seen nothing, he would have had to content himself with scrutinizing a few pictures piecemeal by the light of Kay's pocket torch. Curious to see what effect it would have, Kay went up to a small side chapel nearby, mounted a few steps to a low balustrade, and bending over it shone his torch on the altarpiece. 
The light from a permanent oil lamp hovered over it like an intruder. The first thing Kay perceived, partly by guess, was a huge armored knight on the outermost verge of the picture. He was leaning on his sword, which was stuck into the bare ground, bare except for a stray blade of grass or two. He seemed to be watching attentively some event unfolding itself before his eyes. It was surprising that he should stand so still without approaching nearer to it. Perhaps he had been set there to stand guard. Kay, who had not seen any pictures for a long time, studied this night for a good while, although the greenish light of the oil lamp made his eyes blink. When he played the torch over the rest of the altarpiece, he discovered that it was a portrayal of Christ being laid in the tomb, conventional in style and a fairly recent painting. He pocketed the torch and returned again to his seat. In all likelihood, it was now unnecessary to wait any longer for the Italian, but the rain was probably pouring down outside, and since it was not so cold in the cathedral as Kay expected, he decided to stay there for the present. Quite near him rose the great pulpit. On its small vaulted canopy, two plain golden crucifixes were slanted so that their shafts crossed at the tip. The outer balustrade and the stonework connecting it with the supporting column were wrought all over with foliage in which little angels were entangled, now vivacious and now serene. Kay went up to the pulpit and examined it from all sides. The carving of the stonework was very carefully wrought. The deep caverns of darkness among and behind the foliage looked as if caught and imprisoned there. Kay put his hand into one of them and cautiously felt the contour of the stone. He had never known that this pulpit existed. By pure chance he noticed a verger standing behind the nearest row of benches, a man in a loose hanging black garment with a snuff box in his left hand. He was gazing at Kay. What's the man after? thought Kay. Do I look a suspicious character? Does he want a tip? But when he saw that Kay had become aware of him, the verger started pointing with his right hand, still holding a pinch of snuff in his fingers, in some vaguely indicated direction. His gestures seemed to have little meaning. Kay hesitated for a while, but the verger did not cease pointing at something or other and emphasizing the gesture with nods of his head. What does this man want? said Kay in a low tone. He did not dare to raise his voice in this place. Then he pulled out his purse and made his way along the benches toward him. But the verger at once made a gesture of refusal, shrugged his shoulders and limped away. With something of the same gait, a quick, limping motion, Kay had often as a child imitated a man riding on horseback. A childish old man, thought Kay, with only wits enough to be a verger how he stops when I stop and peers to see if I am following him. Smiling to himself, Kay went on following him through the side aisle, almost as far as the high altar. The old man kept pointing at something, but Kay deliberately refrained from looking round to see what he was pointing at. The gesture could have no other purpose than to shake Kay off. At least he desisted from the pursuit. He did not want to alarm the old man too much. Besides, in case the Italian were to turn up after all, it might be better not to scare away the verger. As he returned to the nave to find the seat on which he had left the album, Kay caught sight of a small side pulpit attached to a pillar almost immediately adjoining the choir. A simple pulpit of plain pale stone. It was so small that from a distance it looked like an empty niche intended for a statue. There was certainly no room for the preacher to take a full step backward from the balustrade. The vaulting of the stone canopy, too, began very low down and curved forward and upward, although without ornamentation, in such a way that a medium-sized man could not stand upright beneath it, but would have to keep leaning over the balustrade. The whole structure was designed as if to torture the preacher. There seemed no comprehensible reason why it should be there at all while the other pulpit, so large and finely decorated, was available. And Kay certainly would not have noticed it had not a lighted lamp been fixed above it, the usual sign that a sermon was going to be preached. Was a sermon going to be delivered now, in the empty church? Kay peered down at the small flight of steps which led upward to the pulpit, hugging the pillar as it went, 
so narrow that it looked like an ornamental addition to the pillar rather than a stairway for human beings. But at the foot of it, Kay smiled in astonishment. There actually stood a priest, ready to ascend, with his hand on the balustrade and his eyes fixed on Kay. The priest gave a little nod and Kay crossed himself and bowed, as he ought to have done earlier. The priest swung himself lightly onto the stairway and mounted into the pulpit with short, quick steps. Was he really going to preach a sermon? Perhaps the verger was not such an imbecile after all, and had been trying to urge Kay toward the preacher, a highly necessary action in that deserted building. But somewhere or other there was an old woman before an image of the Madonna. She ought to be there too. And if it were going to be a sermon, why was it not introduced by the organ? But the organ remained silent, its tall pipes looming faintly in the darkness. Kay wondered whether this was not the time to remove himself quickly. If he did not go now, he would have no chance of doing so during the sermon. He would have to stay as long as it lasted. He was already behindhand in the office and was no longer obliged to wait for the Italian. He looked at his watch. It was 11 o'clock. But was there really going to be a sermon? Could Kay represent the congregation all by himself? What if he had been a stranger merely visiting the church? That was more or less his position. It was absurd to think that a sermon was going to be preached at eleven in the morning on a weekday in such dreadful weather. The priest, he was beyond doubt a priest, a young man with a smooth, dark face, was obviously mounting the pulpit simply to turn out the lamp, which had been lit by mistake. It was not so, however. The priest, after examining the lamp, screwed it higher instead then turned slowly toward the balustrade and gripped the angular edge with both hands. He stood like that for a while, looking around him without moving his head. Kay had retreated a good distance and was leaning his elbows on the foremost pew. Without knowing exactly where the verger was stationed, he was vaguely aware of the old man's bent back, peacefully at rest as if his task had been fulfilled. What stillness there was now in the cathedral! Yet Kay had to violate it for he was not minded to stay. If it were this priest's duty to preach a sermon at a certain hour, regardless of circumstances, let him do it. He could manage it without Kay's support, just as Kay's presence would certainly not contribute to its effectiveness. So he began slowly to move off, feeling his way along the pew on tiptoe until he was in the broad center aisle, where he advanced, undisturbed except for the ringing noise that his lightest footstep made on the stone flags and the echoes that sounded from the vaulted roof faintly but continuously in manifold and regular progression. Kay felt a little forlorn as he advanced, a solitary figure between the rows of empty seats, perhaps with the priest's eyes following him, and the size of the cathedral struck him as bordering on the limit of what human beings could bear. When he came to the seat where he had left the album, he simply snatched the book up without stopping and took it with him. He had almost passed the last of the pews and was emerging into the open space between himself and the doorway when he heard the priest lifting up his voice, a resonant, well-trained voice, how it rolled through the expectant cathedral. But it was no congregation the priest was addressing. The words were unambiguous and inescapable. He was calling out, Joseph, K. Kay paused and stared at the ground before him. For the moment he was still free. He could continue on his way and vanish through one of the small, dark, wooden doors that faced him at no great distance. It would simply indicate that he had not understood the call, or that he had understood it and did not care. But if he were to turn round, he would be caught, for that would amount to an admission that he had understood it very well that he was really the person addressed, and that he was ready to obey. Had the priest called his name a second time, Kay would certainly have gone on. But as everything remained silent, though he stood waiting a long time, he could not help turning his head a little just to see what the priest was doing. The priest was standing calmly in the pulpit as before, yet it was obvious that he had observed Kay's turn of the head. It would have been like a childish game of hide-and-seek if Kay had not turned right round to face him. He did so, and the priest beckoned him to come nearer. 
Since there was now no need for evasion, Kay hurried back. He was both curious and eager to shorten the interview with long flying strides toward the pulpit. At the first rows of seats he halted, but the priest seemed to think the distance still too great. He stretched out an arm and pointed with sharply bent forefinger to a spot immediately before the pulpit. Kay followed this direction too. When he stood on the spot indicated, he had to bend his head far back to see the priest at all. You are Joseph Kay, said the priest, lifting one hand from the balustrade in a vague gesture. Yes, said Kay, thinking how frankly he used to give his name and what a burden it had recently become to him. Nowadays, people he had never seen before seemed to know his name. How pleasant it was to have to introduce oneself before being recognized. You are an accused man, said the priest in a very low voice. Yes, said Kay, so I have been informed. Then you are the man I seek, said the priest. I am the prison chaplain. Indeed, said Kay. I had you summoned here, said the priest, to have a talk with you. I didn't know that, said Kay. I came here to show an Italian round the cathedral. That is beside the point, said the priest. What is that in your hand? Is it a prayer book? No, replied Kay. It is an album of sights worth seeing in the town. Lay it down, said the priest. Kay threw it away so violently that it flew open and slid some way along the floor with disheveled leaves. "'Do you know that your case is going badly?' asked the priest. "'I have no idea myself,' said Kay. "'I've done what I could, but without any success so far. "'Of course my petition isn't finished yet.' "'How do you think it will end?' asked the priest. "'At first I thought it might turn out well,' said Kay. "'But now I frequently have my doubts.' I don't know how it will end. Do you? No, said the priest. But I fear it will end badly. You are held to be guilty. Your case will perhaps never get beyond a lower court. Your guilt is supposed for the present, at least, to have been proved. But I am not guilty, said Kay. It's a mistake, and if it comes to that, how can any man be called guilty? We are all simply men here, one as much as the other. That is true, said the priest, but that's how all guilty men talk. Are you prejudiced against me too? asked Kay. I have no prejudices against you, said the priest. Thank you, said Kay. But all the others who are concerned in these proceedings are prejudiced against me. They are influencing outsiders too. My position is becoming more and more difficult. You are misinterpreting the facts of the case, said the priest. The verdict is not suddenly arrived at. The proceedings only gradually merge into the verdict. So that's how it is, said Kay, letting his head sink. What is the next step you propose to take in the matter? asked the priest. I'm going to get more help, said Kay, looking up again to see how the priest took his statement. There are are several possibilities I haven't explored yet. You cast about too much for outside help, said the priest disapprovingly, especially from women. Don't you see that it isn't the right kind of help? In some cases, even in many, I could agree with you, said Kay, but not always. Women have great influence. If I could move some women I know to join forces in working for me, I couldn't help winning through, especially before this court which consists almost entirely of petticoat hunters. Let the examining magistrate see a woman in the distance, and he knocks down his desk and the defendant in his eagerness to get at her. The priest leaned over the balustrade, apparently feeling for the first time the oppressiveness of the canopy above his head. What fearful weather there must be outside. There was no longer even a murky daylight. Black night had set in. All the stained glass in the great window could not illumine the darkness of the wall with one solitary glimmer of light. And at this very moment the verger began to put the candles on the high altar one after another. "'Are you angry with me?' asked Kay of the priest. 
It may be that you don't know the nature of the court you are serving. He got no answer. These are only my personal experiences, said Kay. There was still no answer from above. I wasn't trying to insult you, said Kay. And at that, the priest shrieked from the pulpit. Can't you see one pace before you? It was an angry cry, but at the same time sounded like the unwary shriek of one who sees another fall and is startled out of his senses. Both were now silent for a long time. In the prevailing darkness, the priest certainly could not make out Kay's features, while Kay saw him distinctly by the light of the small lamp. Why did he not come down from the pulpit? He had not preached a sermon. He had only given Kay some information, which would be likely to harm him rather than help him when he came to consider it. Yet the priest's good intentions seemed to Kay beyond question. It was not impossible that they could come to some agreement if the man would only quit his pulpit. It was not impossible that Kay could obtain decisive and acceptable counsel from him, which might, for instance, point the way, not towards some influential manipulation of the case, but toward a circumvention of it, a breaking away from it altogether, a mode of living completely outside the jurisdiction of the court. This possibility must exist. Kay had of late given much thought to it. And should the priest know of such a possibility, he might perhaps impart his knowledge if he were appealed to, although he himself belonged to the court, and as soon as he heard the court impugned, had forgotten his own gentle nature so far as to shout Kay down. Won't you come down here? said Kay. You haven't got to preach a sermon. Come down beside me. I can come down now, said the priest, perhaps repenting of his outburst. While he detached the lamp from its hook, he said, I had to speak to you first from a distance. Otherwise, I am too easily influenced and tend to forget my duty. Kay waited for him at the foot of the steps. The priest stretched out his hand to Kay, while he was still on the way down from a higher level. Have you a little time for me? asked Kay. As much time as you need, said the priest, giving Kay the small lamp to carry. Even close at hand, he still wore a certain air of solemnity. You are very good to me, said Kay. They paced side by side up and down the dusky aisle. But you are an exception among those who belong to the court. I have more trust in you than in any of the others, though I know many of them. With you I can speak openly. Don't be deluded, said the priest. How am I being deluded? asked Kay. You are deluding yourself about the court, said the priest. In the writings which preface the law, that particular delusion is described thus. Before the law stands a doorkeeper. To this doorkeeper there comes a man from the country who begs for admittance to the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot admit the man at the moment. The man, on reflection, asks if he will be allowed, then, to enter later. It is possible, answers the doorkeeper, but not at this moment. Since the door leading into the law stands open as usual, and the doorkeeper steps to one side, the man bends down to peer through the entrance. When the doorkeeper sees that, he laughs and says, If you are so strongly tempted, try to get in without my permission. But note that I am powerful, and I am only the lowest doorkeeper. From hall to hall, keepers stand at every door one more powerful than the other, and the sight of the third man is already more than even I can stand. These are the difficulties which the man from the country has not expected to meet. The law, he thinks, should be accessible to every man and at all times. But when he looks more closely at the doorkeeper in his furred robe, with his huge pointed nose and long, thin, tartar beard, he decides that he had better wait until he gets permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit down at the side of the door. 
There he sits waiting for days and years. He makes many attempts to be allowed in and wearies the doorkeeper with his importunity. The doorkeeper often engages him in brief conversation, asking him about his home and about other matters, but the questions are put quite impersonally, as great men put questions, and always conclude with the statement that the man cannot be allowed to enter yet. The man, who has equipped himself with many things for his journey, parts with all he has, however valuable, in the hope of bribing the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper accepts it all, saying, however, as he takes each gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. During all these long years, the man watches the doorkeeper almost incessantly. He forgets about the other doorkeepers, and this one seems to him the only barrier between himself and the law. In the first years, he curses his evil fate aloud. Later, as he grows old, he only mutters to himself. He grows childish, and since in his prolonged study of the doorkeeper, he has learned to know even the fleas in his fur collar. He begs the very fleas to help him and to persuade the doorkeeper to change his mind. Finally, his eyes grow dim, and he does not know whether the world is really darkening around him or whether his eyes are only deceiving him. But in the darkness, he can now perceive a radiance that streams inextinguishably from the door of the law. Now his life is drawing to a close. Before he dies, all that he has experienced during the whole time of his sojourn condenses in his mind into one question, which he has never yet put to the doorkeeper. He beckons the doorkeeper since he can no longer raise his stiffening body. The doorkeeper has to bend far down to hear him, for the difference in size between them has increased very much to the man's disadvantage. What do you want to know now? asked the doorkeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives to attain the law, answers the man. How does it come about then that in all these years no one has come seeking admittance but me? The doorkeeper perceives that the man is nearing his end and his hearing is failing, so he bellows in his ear. No one but you could gain admittance through this door, since this door was intended for you. I am now going to shut it. So the doorkeeper deceived the man, said Kay immediately, strongly attracted by the story. Don't be too hasty, said the priest. Don't take over someone else's opinion without testing it. I have told you the story in the very words of the scriptures. There's no mention of deception in it. But it's clear enough, said Kay, and your first interpretation of it was quite right. The doorkeeper gave the message of salvation to the man only when it could no longer help him. He was not asked the question any earlier, said the priest. And you must consider, too, that he was only a doorkeeper and as such fulfilled his duty. What makes you think he fulfilled his duty? asked Kay. He didn't fulfill it. His duty might have been to keep all strangers away, but this man, for whom the door was intended, should have been let in. You have not enough respect for the written word, and you are altering the story, said the priest. The story contains two important statements made by the doorkeeper about admission to the law, one at the beginning, the other at the end. The first statement is that he cannot admit the man at the moment. And the other is that this door was intended only for the man. If there were a contradiction between the two, you would be right and the doorkeeper would have deceived the man. But there is no contradiction. The first statement, on the contrary, even implies the second. One could almost say that in suggesting to the man the possibility of future admittance, the doorkeeper is exceeding his duty. At that time, his apparent duty is only to refuse admittance and indeed, many commentators are surprised that the suggestion should be made at all, since the doorkeeper appears to be a precision with a stern regard for duty. He does not once leave his post during these many years, and he does not shut the door until the very last minute. He is conscious of the importance of his office, for he says, I am powerful. He is respectful to his superiors, for he says, I am only the lowest doorkeeper. He is not garrulous 
for during all these years, he puts only what are called impersonal questions. He is not to be bribed, for he says, in accepting a gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. Where his duty is concerned, he is to be moved neither by pity nor rage, for we are told that the man wearied the doorkeeper with his importunity. And finally, even his external appearance hints at a pedantic character, the large, pointed nose and the long, thin, black, tartar beard. Could one imagine a more faithful doorkeeper? Yet the doorkeeper has other elements in his character which are likely to advantage anyone seeking admittance and which make it comprehensible enough that he should somewhat exceed his duty in suggesting the possibility of future admittance. For it cannot be denied that he is a little simple-minded and consequently a little conceited. Take the statements he makes about his power and the power of the other doorkeepers and their dreadful aspect, which even he cannot bear to see. I hold that these statements may be true enough, but that the way in which he brings them out shows that his perceptions are confused by the simpleness of mind and conceit. The commentators note in this connection, the right perception of any matter and a misunderstanding of the same matter do not wholly exclude each other. One must at any rate assume that such simpleness and conceit, however sparingly manifest, are likely to weaken his defense of the door. They are breaches in the character of the doorkeeper. To this must be added the fact that the doorkeeper seems to be a friendly creature by nature. He is by no means always on his official dignity. In the very first moments he allows himself the jest of inviting the man to enter in spite of the strictly maintained veto against entry. Then he does not, for instance, send the man away, but gives him, as we are told, a stool and lets him sit down beside the door. The patience with which he endures the man's appeals during so many years, the brief conversations, the acceptance of the gifts, the politeness with which he allows the man to curse loudly in his presence the fate for which he himself is responsible, all this lets us deduce certain feelings of pity. Not every doorkeeper would have acted thus. And finally, in answer to a gesture of the man, he bends down to give him the chance of putting a last question. Nothing but mild impatience. The doorkeeper knows that this is the end of it all, is discernible in the words, you are insatiable. Some push this mode of interpretation even further and hold that these words express a kind of friendly admiration, though not without a hint of condescension. At any rate, the figure of the doorkeeper can be said to come out very differently from what you fancied. You have studied the story more exactly and for a longer time than I have, said Kay. They are both silent for a little while. Then Kay said, So you think the man was not deceived? Don't misunderstand me, said the priest. I am only showing you the various opinions concerning that point. You must not pay too much attention to them. The scriptures are unalterable, and the comments often enough merely express the commentator's despair. In this case, there even exists an interpretation which claims that the deluded person is really the doorkeeper. That's a far-fetched interpretation, said Kay. On what is it based? It is based, answered the priest, on the simple-mindedness of the doorkeeper. The argument is that he does not know the law from inside. He knows only the way that leads to it, where he patrols up and down. His ideas of the interior are assumed to be childish, and it is supposed that he himself is afraid of the other guardians, whom he holds up as bogies before the man. Indeed, he fears them more than the man does, since the man is determined to enter after hearing about the dreadful guardians of the interior, while the doorkeeper has no desire to enter, at least not so far as we are told. Others again say that he must have been in the interior already, since he is after all engaged in the service of the law, and can only have been appointed from inside. This is countered by arguing that he may have been appointed by a voice calling from the interior, and that anyhow he cannot have been far inside, since the aspect of the third doorkeeper is more than he can endure. Moreover, no indication is given that during all these years he ever made any remarks showing a knowledge of the interior, except for the one remark about the doorkeepers. He may have been forbidden to do so, but there is no mention of that either. On these grounds, the conclusion is reached that he knows nothing about the aspect and significance of the interior, so that he is in a state of delusion. 
but he is deceived also about his relation to the man from the country, for he is inferior to the man and does not know it. He treats the man instead as his own subordinate, as can be recognized from many details that must still be fresh in your mind. But according to the this view of the story, it is just as clearly indicated that he is really subordinated to the man. In the first place, a bondman is always subject to a free man. Now, the man from the country is really free. He can go where he likes. It is only the law that is closed to him, and access to the law is forbidden him only by one individual, the doorkeeper. When he sits down on the stool by the side of the door and stays there for the rest of his life, he does it of his own free will. In the story, there is no mention of any compulsion. But the doorkeeper is bound to his post by his very office. He does not dare go out into the country, nor apparently may he go into the interior of the law, even should he wish to. Besides, although he is the service of the law, his service is confined to this one entrance. That is to say, he serves only this man for whom alone the entrance is intended. On that ground, too, he is inferior to the man. One must assume that for many years... For as long as it takes a man to grow up to the prime of his life, his service was in a sense an empty formality, since he had to wait for a man to come, that is to say someone in the prime of life, and so he had to wait a long time before the purpose of his service could be fulfilled, and moreover had to wait on the man's pleasure, for the man came of his own free will. But the termination of his service also depends on the man's term of life, so that to the very end he is subject to to the man. And it is emphasized throughout that the doorkeeper apparently realizes nothing of all this, that it is not in itself remarkable, since according to this interpretation, the doorkeeper is deceived in a much more important issue, affecting his very office. At the end, for example, he says regarding the entrance to the law, I'm now going to shut it. But at the beginning of the story, we are told that the door leading into the law always stands open. And if it always stands open, that is to say at all times, without reference to the life or death of the man, then the doorkeeper cannot close it. There is some difference of opinion about the motive behind the doorkeeper's statement, whether he said he was going to close the door merely for the sake of giving an answer, or to emphasize his devotion to duty, or to bring the man into a state of grief and regret in his last moments. But there is no lack of agreement that the doorkeeper will not be able to shut the door. Many indeed profess to find that he is subordinate to the man even in knowledge, toward the end at least, for the man sees the radiance that issues from the door of the law, while the doorkeeper in his official position must stand with his back to the door, nor does he say anything to show that he has perceived the change. That is well argued, said K. after repeating to himself in a low voice several passages from the priest's exposition. It is well argued, and I am inclined to agree that the doorkeeper is deceived. But that has not made me abandon my former opinion, since both conclusions are to some extent compatible. Whether the doorkeeper is clear-sighted or deceived does not dispose of the matter. I said the man is deceived. If the doorkeeper is clear-sighted, one might have doubts about that. But if the doorkeeper himself is deceived, then his deception must of necessity be communicated to the man. That makes the doorkeeper not indeed a deceiver, but a creature so simple-minded that he ought to be dismissed at once from his office. You mustn't forget that the doorkeeper's deceptions do himself no harm, but do infinite harm to the man. There are no objections to that, said the priest. Many aver that the story confers no right on anyone to pass judgment on the doorkeeper. Whatever he may seem to us, he is yet a servant of the law. That is, he belongs to the law, and as such is beyond human judgment. In that case, one must not believe that the doorkeeper is subordinate to the man. Bound as he is by his service, even only at the door of the law, he is incomparably greater than anyone at large in the world. The man is only seeking the law. The doorkeeper is already attached to it. It is the law that has placed him at his post. To doubt his dignity is to doubt the law itself. I don't agree with that point of view, said Kay, shaking his head. For if one accepts it, one must accept as true everything the doorkeeper says, but you yourself have sufficiently proved how impossible it is to do that. No, said the priest, it is not necessary to accept everything as true, one must only accept it as necessary. A melancholy conclusion, said Kay. 
It turns lying into a universal principle. Kay said that with finality, but it was not his final judgment. He was too tired to survey all the conclusions arising from the story, and the trains of thought into which it was leading him were unfamiliar. Dealing with impalibilities better suited to a theme for discussion among court officials than for him. The simple story had lost its clear outline. He wanted to put it out of his mind, and the priest, who now showed great delicacy of feeling, suffered him to do so and accepted his comment in silence, although he undoubtedly did not agree with it. They paced up and down for a while in silence, Kay walking close beside the priest, ignorant of his whereabouts. The lamp in his hand had long since gone out. The silver image of some saint once glimmered into sight immediately before him by the sheen of its own silver and was instantaneously lost in the darkness again. To keep himself from being utterly dependent on the priest, Kay asked, Aren't we near the main doorway now? No, said the priest. We're a long way from it. Do you want to leave already? Although at that moment Kay had not been thinking of leaving, he answered at once, Of course, I I must go. I'm the chief clerk of a bank. They're waiting for me. I only came here to show a business friend from abroad round the cathedral. Well, said the priest, reaching out his hand to Kay, then go. But I can't find my way alone in this darkness, said Kay. Turn left to the wall, said the priest. Then follow the wall without leaving it and you'll come to a door. The priest had already taken a step or two away from him. But Kay cried out in a loud voice, Please wait a moment. I am waiting, said the priest. Don't you want anything from me? asked Kay. No, said the priest. You were so friendly to me for a time, said Kay, and explained so much to me, and now you let me go as if you cared nothing about me. But you have to leave now, said the priest. Well, yes, said Kay. You must see that I can't help it. You must first see who I am, said the priest. You are the prison chaplain, said Kay, groping his way near to the priest again. His immediate return to the bank was not so necessary as he had made out. He could quite well stay longer. That means I belong to the court, said the priest. So why should I want anything from you? The court wants nothing from you. It receives you when you come, and it dismisses you when you go. That has been an excerpt of Franz Kafka's The Trial, Chapter 9, The Cathedral, narrated by Joseph Vobel.